Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 28. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They'll rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the animals, all the earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. Turn with me to chapter 2, uh, verse 15, and we'll read verses 15 to 25. The Lord God took the man and placed him in the Garden of Eden to work it and watch over it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. From the day you eat from it, you'll certainly die. Then the Lord God said, It's not good for the man to be alone. I'll make a helper who is like him. So the Lord God formed out of the ground each wild animal and each bird of the sky and brought each to the man to see what he would call it. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the sky and to every wild animal. But for the man, no helper was found who was like him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to come over the man and he slept. God took one of his ribs and closed the flesh at that place. Then the Lord God made the rib he'd taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, This one at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman, for she was taken from man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife, and the two become one flesh. Both the man and his wife were naked, yet felt no shame. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, There's a sermon outline there for you inside your newsletters, left-hand side, and uh, we're going to work through a number of Bible passages, and so I'll have them up on the overhead. Uh, Hopefully I'll be able to manage the technology. Uh, But if someone said to you, marriage is dot, 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 what would you say? How would you complete that definition? Uh, In a legal sense... The current Australian Marriage Act now defines marriage as, quote, the union of two people to the exclusion of all others voluntarily entered into for life, end quote. Uh, In a revisionist statement that I read this week from The Guardian in April 2023, one academic stated that wedlock is whatever you choose to make it. And then we had an article about her wedding and what she had chosen to make of marriage. In the same article, a relationship counsellor is quoted from 2002 as saying that, quote, marriage will be extinct in 30 years. They're a relationship counsellor you go to, and yet there are arguments for and against marriage still, aren't there? Isn't it remarkable that debates for and against marriage have really been around since Adam and Eve and since that time in the garden? It's very important to understand a definition about marriage because I can't think of a culture that doesn't have marriage. I can't think of a culture that doesn't have marriage. And often as you compare cultures, you'll see that the bones of marriage are the same across cultures, across every culture. So really, this is a definition that impacts every culture in the world, doesn't it? Marriage is dot, dot, dot. So what is it? More importantly, as God's mob, what does God say about it? And that's what we're going to hopefully briefly look at today. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Thank you for its clarity. Please forgive the way in which we confuse it. Father, thank you that you are God and that we are your creation made in your image. Father, help us to hear Apply and delight in your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, let me be very clear. I'm not going to cover every question about marriage today, nor every facet. So, for example, if you did Bible study this week, I'm not even going to touch on 1 Corinthians 7. Uh, There will be a question time at the end of the sermon, and hopefully if you have some questions, you can ask them then. What I do want to do is to try and get at least some of the basics set out. 
And then I want to finish with five observations. We're going to move, as you'll see there in your sermon outline, through a number of passages that trace marriage through the pattern of the Bible. Uh, I'm at point two on the outline, and, and a few people have commented to me this week, Bernard, we are spending a lot of time in Genesis. And we are, aren't we? Uh, it shouldn't surprise us, given that that's the foundation for the rest of the Bible. Uh, not only should it not surprise us, but we should pay attention to our Lord and Saviour, who whenever he is asked a question on marriage, where does he go? Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, if you're listening to Seth as he read from Ephesians, where, where does Paul go? Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, we need to get this straight before we move any further. Uh, let me remind you again of what Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28 says. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. They'll rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the animals, all the earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them, male and female. God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, every creature that crawls on the earth. We covered that last week, didn't we? We dived into that as we looked at sex and gender and we looked at God's design for human sexuality. God makes humans in his image. Notice the use of pronouns. They are around from Genesis 1, pronouns were, male and female. I want us to notice here too that there is a fundamental and irremovable equality. Male and female are made in the image of God. It is there in the first chapter. Male and female are equal in God's design. Central to was what we looked at last week, uh, uh, the bodiness, the physicality of God's creation. Humans bear the image of God in their bodies. Uh, that's expressed in biological sex. Remember we looked at that last week, man and woman, male and female, partners in reproduction and so bearing the image of God. And I want us to notice too, as Stephen helped us think about, they have a twin job. They are to rule and they are to reproduce. They are to rule and then they're to fill the world with little image bearers of God. And we're going to talk about those little image bearers in two weeks' time when we look at children. And notice that they are to express the image of God. God is three in one. Humans are two in one. And so they bear the image of God in every aspect of life. But I want us at this point, because I think this sets up the rest of the Bible, I want us at this point to do what Genesis 1 does. I want us to get the big picture Genesis 1, as I've said a number of times, is kind of like a drone in a movie. It's flying over the whole landscape. So you see the big picture of God's creation in those seven days. And the big picture is this. Male and female exist in the service of God. Male and female exist in the service of God. And that will be crucial for understanding marriage. You can see it in two ways. First, they bear an image, don't they? They're meant to look like the one whose image they bear. The existence of male and female is to bear the image of God. And that is their crucial job. And notice that they are the same. They share a fundamental same. They're both human. We'll get to that in Genesis 2. But no, notice the fundamental difference. Both human, male and female. And with that crucial sameness and difference, they bear the image of God as individuals in community. Notice, secondly, that they've got a very clear job description, don't they? God is so clear to humans and their whole life is described by his command and his provision. Notice there that he commands them to be fruitful, multiply and fill the earth. Go and make a whole lot of image bearers. That's your job as male and female in this thing we'll end up calling marriage. Notice that as they reproduce, they're to rule the world. They're to garden all of creation, as we'll see in Genesis 2. And notice, when God gives them the commands, he also gives them everything they need for it. 
when you get down into verses 29 to 31, he, he gives them the food and he provides for all their daily needs. Now, is the word marriage mentioned here? It's actually not even mentioned anywhere in the creation account, the word marriage. And yet the bones of marriage are here, aren't they? The bones of marriage are here, male and female, joined, bearing fruit in intimacy, bearing fruit as they serve God, bearing his image, male and female, in the service of God. If Genesis 1 is the big picture drone for you, remember I said last week, Genesis 2 is the Google Maps street for you. And as we move, point three on the outline, as we move into Genesis 2, we'll actually see more and more of God's design for men and women together. Remember, it's in the service of God, and now we begin to see this in a more detailed way. If you've got Genesis 2 open there, notice that in verse 8, the man is placed in the garden of God's creation. The life of the man is under the rule of God. God places him. And God doesn't place him willy-nilly, does he? God's actually made a garden. And then he picks the man up, notice that in verse 15, and (laughs) places him in the garden. And notice there in verse 15 that the man has a particular job. The man is in the garden to work it and to watch over it. God gives the environment. God gives the command. And the man is to serve God in this. Verses 16 to 17, notice that there are very clear commands around this. In fact, we dealt with this in Scripture. Mr. Gabbett complicates things in Scripture. He has three class rules. God has one. God has one. God is so simple and clear in his command, isn't he? Everything here is free for you to eat from. Just don't eat from that tree. And notice that God maps out the consequences. Not only is he clear in his command and overly generous in his provision, he then says, let me tell you what will happen. If you eat from that tree, you'll die. Notice how it is very similar to Genesis 1. But the surprising thing is what God says in verse 18. Then the Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I'll I'll make a helper who is like him. It's a striking statement, isn't it? Remember what we've had in Genesis chapter 1? Good, 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 good. Oh, very good. Notice here we have the first not good. And notice the not goodness is connected with the service of God. It is not good for the man to be alone. He can't do the job I've given him. Now, that makes sense, doesn't it? (laughs) You can't bear the image of three in one when you're on your own, in this sense. You actually can't produce a whole lot of image bearers for God if you're on your own. And by consequence, you can't rule the world in God's design on your own. And that has all sorts of implications for the way we work together as men and women. But it also has implications, as we'll see in a moment, for what marriage is. Notice, too, the word helper. I've put it in yellow, just so it stands out. It's not derogatory. It's not a put-down. It's not establishing a social hierarchy. Who else is a helper in God's word? A winner who... The helper is. In Exodus 18.4, it's God himself. In Deuteronomy 33.7, it's God himself. In 1 Samuel 7 verse 12, it's God himself. I'm going to make a helper for the man. I hope we understand what's going on here. The helper must be the same and the helper must be different so that the job at hand can be done. And so God creates a helper. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to come over the man and he slept. God took one of his ribs or sides, as we learnt last week, and closed the flesh at that place. Then the Lord God made the rib he'd taken from the man into a woman, brought her to the man, and the man said, This one at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman, for she was taken from man. Why the at last? It's been a big day because Adam's had to name all the animals. Notice the way in which Genesis 2 describes that. 
God makes each and brings them to Adam and says, is this the helper? Notice that. Uh, Adam's already exercising some of his role as a ruler because only God names until this point. Who now names? Uh, Adam names. He's now exercising the rule, but he needs a helper. And notice the way in which God acts. Remember the sacred architecture from last week, the body? How God takes a side from that temple and then custom builds. That's the language. Custom builds a helper, the woman. And she is of the same type as the man and distinct from the whole rest of creation. Notice that in how Adam speaks, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman for she was taken from man. And notice, please, how delighted he is, how warm and intimate and awesome his words are. This is my help. This is my companion. This is, this is woman. The same as me, but different. And so they can fulfill their job as workers and watchers, as rulers and reproducers. They'll garden the world together in service to God. And notice that God's word makes explicit what we know is going on here. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife. They become one flesh. Both the man and his wife were naked, yet felt no shame. Now, again, notice the word marriage isn't there. But we can't miss it, can we? In fact, Jesus makes sure we can't miss it. When he is asked about marriage, where does he go? Here in Genesis 1, 26 to 28, this is God's design for marriage. Several things are striking. I love the old English. I think we've missed something by losing the old English. There is leaving and cleaving. There is leaving and cleaving. Oh, the word cleave there is to stick irremovably, inseparably. Uh, and the language is the language of covenant. Only one other group of people has this language applied to them. Who's that? God's people. Cleave to God. Stick to God. Deuteronomy 10.20, Deuteronomy 11.22, Deuteronomy 13.4. Stick to God permanently. Leave, cleave. There is a permanent and lifelong union here, even at the sake of your own birth family. And notice that the cleaving is described physically, one flesh, relationally. Here's why blood is thicker than water. This is a whole new family unit. Uh, There's a physical reality here. Here's the place for sexual intimacy. Here's the place for that physical language of deep and abiding relationship in the sacred architecture made by God. And it's relational. They create a whole new family unit. This is our mob. There's no doubt about the force of that statement. This is the norm. So here's our definition for marriage. One man, one woman, for life, in union, physical, relational, in a binding covenant. One man, one woman, in union, physical, relational, in a binding covenant. Now, notice there's no marriage ceremony, is there? That's a really striking fact. But notice that all the aspects of the marriage ceremony are there. It's a public event. You can't leave your parents' home and not make it public, can you? Notice that there's a promise and a commitment. There's the covenant language. Notice that there are witnesses, all of creation, and God himself, all the bones of a wedding ceremony are here and also the delight. There is a deep emotional delight here as man and woman join together in something that is wonderful and tender and awesome. And everything around it says this is in service to whom? It's in service to God. Watching and working, ruling and reproducing, marriage is in the service of God. Still goes that well, doesn't it? It doesn't, does it? Because what comes after Genesis 2? Genesis 
chapter 3. And we know the reality of the fall. I'm at point four on the outline. We know what comes into the world, don't we? We know that a lie is spoken and disobedience comes forth. I'm God, God's not. I'm going to eat that fruit even though God has given me one clear command and has not been stingy in his provision. We know the result, don't we? Everything that God said, and this is a remarkable thing about God, it happens just like he said. No surprise. There is now death because disobedience towards God and his clear commands has removed humans from the presence of God, from relationship with him. It breaks us. It breaks the world. And it breaks marriage in the service of God. If you're familiar with Genesis chapter 3, you'll notice that it breaks marriage by mucking up the relationship, doesn't it? You see, the thing that should have been gardened, the snake, now talks to the helper, the woman, who leads the man who should have spoken up earlier as the one who knew the clear command of God. And what does God do in his judgment? God restores the order, doesn't he? God puts it back in place. He speaks to the snake, he speaks to the woman, he speaks to the man, but it is broken under his judgment, isn't it? Work is now toil and is full of tears. How hard is marriage? Well, we heard about that in Matthew 19 two weeks ago, didn't we? And you notice that the differences that were a delight in marriage now cause damaging division. God said to the woman, I'll intensify your labor pains, you'll bear children in anguish, your desire will be for your husband, yet he'll dominate you. That, that's not the language we had before, is it? The language of domination, the language of wanting someone else's job, the language of damage, a sin broke marriage. And so now all those very good privileges of marriage, the intimacy of that warm relationship that comes from it, that's all been let loose, hasn't it? That's all been let loose in the world and removed from the place where it belongs. And marriage is now no longer in the service of God, is it? <laughs> Left to our own desires. Uh, Firstly, we don't want to bear God's image because my image is so much better. We no longer see marriage as about God, as representing him, but now everything is about representing me. And the state of the world, despite all of our advertising and despite all of our efforts, what, what is the world? It is a very messy garden, isn't it? It is a very messy garden full of gardeners who are negligent. That brokenness, I'm at point five on the outline, that brokenness is met by a bloke who actually bears the image. One of the really remarkable things this week is that marriage is restored by a single man. He's the image, notice image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, because by him everything was created in heaven and on earth, the visible, the invisible, whether thrones, dominions, rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He's before all things, by him all things hold together. Head of the body, the church, beginning, firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile everything to himself by making peace through the blood of his cross, whether things on earth or things in heaven. The key issue we face is not loneliness, is not a lack of a job, is not broken relationship, though all those things are crucially important. The key thing we face is sin. And the only place our problem will be solved is where? It's in the image of God, which is Jesus Christ himself. He lives what we couldn't live but should and then he dies the death we deserve so that in rising from the dead he can say, I've beaten sin and its consequence 
and we trust that that is right and true and sufficient and so are reconciled to God and who we are as humans. Jesus never married, despite Dan Brown's assertions. But Jesus resolves our problem and the brokenness of our marriages by restoring us to what God designed. He is the image bearer of God, so we can bear again the image of God. He is the image bearer of God, so marriage can now serve God rightly. And once that takes place, that fulfilment of who we are as humans, we can actually live marriage out in the service of God. I'm at the last, second last point on the outline, and this is the reading that Seth brought us from Ephesians chapter 5. Now, there's all sorts of debate about Ephesians 5, isn't there? Uh, if you've got your Bibles there, turn to it. I think it's page 1039. And as you turn to it, I want you to look at it with me and just notice these points before we finish. Marriage exists for the service of God again. One of the great things that we get straight up there in Ephesians chapter 5 is the description of marriage as a living, breathing picture of God's love for his mob. Now, we've got to remember, uh, Paul is writing to a bunch of people who are already married. They were married as non-Christians. And he's saying to them, come with me to see God's design. Two different humans male and female, committed in lifelong union with each other, reflecting Jesus and the church, God, in all of his goodness. In that sense, just like in Genesis 1 and 2, the roles in marriage aren't about a hierarchy. But do you notice what Paul says there in verse 21? It's a mutual service of each other. In fulfilling these roles as a man and a woman, we serve each other. And notice, God is very clear. He never says, make sure the other's doing their job. Do you notice that? Look after your own job. Men, women. And I want us to notice that marriage is not designed here to fulfill you as a human being. Did you notice that? Where, where are you fulfilled as a human being? You, you're fulfilled just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Christ makes you holy. Christ cleanses you. Christ will present you in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing but holy and blameless. Jesus deals with our sins so we can be truly human and live as humans and in marriage as God designed us to be. And that mutual service of each other in marriage in those different roles points to him so we can actually serve God as he designed. Well, now you can take a breath because that's been a massive tour, hasn't it? All over the, And we haven't even got to Revelation. But let me finish by drawing out five really quick practical points. Have we covered everything? No, not even close. But have we laid out the basics? Yes, I think we have. Here are five observations. First, human restoration and fulfilment takes place where? In Jesus alone. Sin broke creation. And so dealing with sin restores God's design. To be truly human is to be reconciled to God. And that happens alone through whom? Through Jesus Christ. Second, marriage is in the service of God. That's evident in creation and restoration. Marriage is not about our fulfilment. Marriage is not about our needs or wants. Marriage is created by God for his service. Does that make it cold and mechanical? No, it doesn't, does it? Just read again those words of Adam. Bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, constant delight and warmth and intimacy. But now we have a picture of what marriage is for. Third, marriage then reflects the image of God to the world. This is so important. Two equal but different people brought together, male and female, to reflect God three in one. If we lose that difference and sameness, we lose 
a living, breathing, daily picture of God in our world. Do you think that's significant if we do that? Fourth, within marriage, the roles of man and woman are roles for the mutual service of each other and in doing that for God. That actually points people daily to Jesus and his love for his people and to God himself. Those roles matter. Fifth, I think God is very clear that for his people, his design is for them to marry within the mob. If we don't, we will bring two different understandings of the purpose of marriage into the home, won't we? And they will clash in such a way that marriage won't serve God as God designed. I'm going to finish there because I reckon you've probably got a whole lot of questions. But as we do finish, I want us to think very carefully, if we lose that design for marriage, what do we lose in God's creation? What do we lose in God's creation? Let me pray. Father, thank you for the picture of marriage. Uh, It's massive. It's really everywhere in the Bible. Uh, across every culture, uh, in every generation. Uh, Father, we've only just scratched the surface and, Father, we desire to dig more deeply into it. Uh, Father, thank you that marriage is created for your service and in that it paints a daily, intimate, warm and awesome picture of your nature and your love. Father, please help us to have marriages like that and to proclaim that good news to the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Any quick questions? Baxter. Um, If we use marriage to represent God's world, how do we do that for the people? Baxter, that's a corker, okay? Uh, For those at home, (laughs) for those at home, Uh, If we use marriage as the picture of God, how can we do that when we're single? Uh, I think this is really important. Uh, Firstly, because Dan's going to preach on singleness next week, so I could just pass it out like a decent halfback and leave that ball to him. Uh, But I won't, because given a microphone, I'll always express my opinions. Um, I I think I, I want us to notice, what did I say at the end of Genesis 1? Notice that I said there that men and women are created for the service of God. And so as a man or a woman, you can serve God as you are. And notice that our Saviour perfectly showed the image of God as a single man. That's really important because I think, and I don't think I'm stealing any of Dan's thunder here because I don't want to do that. I think that helps us rejig our view that singleness is just a train station on the way to what we should be. Now, what you should be is a human being reconciled to God. God's constant statement in his word is his desire for us to be godly. And so if you are not married, you can still represent God's image because you're a man or a woman who's been created to serve God. So we can garden in the world as a man or a woman who is single to the glory of God. And God gives us this mob as a family, and Dan's going to unpack this massively next week. Is that right, mate? Beauty. This is your family. And so you can help in the creation of little image bearers for God as a single person here, can't you? Uh, You can rule the world. You can garden together with other men and women here, can't you? And so I I, I hope that kind of starts a bit of an answer for you, Baxter, doesn't it? You, You can still serve God like this. Now, notice when God made them, he made them male and female to then work the world. And at the end of the chapter, we get the picture of that in marriage. But at no point does he say, you can't do this as a community, which they already are. And so I think that's really important. Does that give you a bit of an answer, mate? Beauty. Any other questions? Mm. And nowhere in scripture are we actually in words 
No. Yep. So I'm just wondering, I know there's covenant that yep. is there, but where does that come in and how? That good question, great question. Uh, so the question is, where do where does the is, let, correct me if I'm wrong? Where does the concept and wording of promises come in in God's design for marriage? Is that right? A, a succinct summary. Yep. A really good question because usually when I chat to people, like we do um, wedding preparation, meet with people for six times, and we do wedding preparation. And uh, what does everyone think the promises on your wedding day are? Uh, everyone thinks it's I do. That's Hollywood. Of course you're going to do it on that day because you look stunning. Every wedding promise is future tense. I will. Because you're making promises for the rest of your life, not just for your wedding day. So promises matter. Uh, It's really interesting. None of the authors I've read this week deal with that. All of them point to the language of covenant in Genesis 2 and say it is unmistakable from here that covenant involves promise, and the only other time covenant or language like this is used is in the covenant between God and his people, which involves promises, which is right the way through the Old Testament. And so they say the promises are here because of the language of covenant used. That's what they say there, and then you then get that unfolded as promises are both broken and kept, but always kept by God himself. Yeah. You actually have a whole dialogue and language mm. around God's covenant. Yep, yep. Which we don't have here. No, and I think all the authors I've read this week have consistently said, if you want to know what it looks like in marriage, look at that because that's what marriage points to. Yeah. So they say, look at those promises. So, for example, Exodus 19, uh, 1 to 8, uh, you're my royal priest and a holy nation of people belonging to me called you out of darkness, uh, called you into my service. What are you going to do? We're going to obey everything. So right there at Exodus 19 where God creates his people, covenantal language, there are promises. Uh, and notice too that they are both future and present tense, just like the promises with Abraham, Genesis 15, uh, obey me. And so all the authors seem to go, no language of pro- just like there's no language of a service. We don't have any service. There's a lot of flexibility for cultural aspects there, which is really terrific. But they say covenant language is unmistakable. Covenant language involves promises. If you want to know what that looks like, look at God and his people, which is what's then talked about in Ephesians 5. So I think that's as far as I could go. Yeah, that's a bit of an answer. Yeah. Any other questions? Seamus. Um, Same related to the reading, but not the topic. Looking at Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, um, I've seen that uh, in Genesis 1 the animals were created before Adam and Eve were created, and then in Genesis 2 Adam was created and then the animals made. Um, Uh, Listen, I'll give you 10 commentaries and you can have 10 versions. Uh, I think that's probably one of it. I think um, Genesis 1, like I've said, is the top-down view. I I think we've got to keep that distinction clear. And I think, too, Genesis 2 is written with Genesis 1 very clearly in mind and not contradicting anything there but done in such a way that we pick up certain important truths. So let me pick a very important statement in our world. I heard it last night at the show. Okay, with the animals on top thing. Uh, a man's best friend is what? Your dog. Oh, well, actually, Genesis chapter 2 tells you that's not the case. Because every single created thing is brought to Adam and God, is, is this your best friend? Uh, no, it's not. And so I think Genesis 2 is that street level walking through that takes you from the drone down into the nitty gritty so that you understand everyday aspects of life. Is there a contradiction there? No, I don't think there is. But there is a a, a retelling of it so we pick up the points about who we are. It's just like my dad says, Genesis 3, which does a similar thing, Genesis 3 explains why we need roundup, clothes and don't like snakes. Because labouring in the paddock is going to be hard work and you'll deal with weeds. You'll now be clothed because you've decided you know better and you know what a snake does. And so similar things, and I think that's helpful for dealing with Genesis. How is this helping me deal with questions in Narrabri this year? Because you'll find answers in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. And I think that's part of it. 
That's a partial answer, Shane. Is that all right? Beauty.